the when they merged together. I think that may have been like two or three years ago. Yeah. So yeah, I never I never did the Starwood. Okay, so you uh, didn't go through the uh, the hassle of being undervalued and your points being moved over and this and that. No, <laughs> no. So did you get to keep all of your points or? What they did was they times them by three, basically. So if you had a, a thousand, it became three thousand. But the, oh the problem for yeah, but the problem for like the Starwood people was it didn't quite add up, and not everything was the same. Like for instance, every Starwood. Um, uh, stay, they would give you 500 bonus points, and Marriott does that, but it, it's not the same as it should be 1500. So, you used to get free points just by staying. It, so, little things like that, but I'm used to that. Oh, okay. No, but, unfortunately, I didn't. I would have liked to, you know, break up those points, though. Oh, uh, totally. But the benefits are great, the sweet nights are great, and uh, yeah. you know. If they don't stop raising all the uh, redemption values, it'd be pretty cool too, especially for the top uh, property. You know? How many points do you have? If you don't mind me asking, I got about a million and a half. Okay, you you have more than me. I I only have about a million right now, but I I had redeemed some points back in. Well, I guess it was a while ago. Now November, I can't believe it's May. I know it's insane. So crazy. Um, Almost, I yeah. redeemed some points then, and then in October too. I um I, I redeemed. I was in Europe for three weeks, uh, right right before, right until March twelfth is when I had to fly home. So, um, I was using Marriott points pretty much every day, and I was in like Amsterdam, Berlin, Munich, like a whole bunch of different places. So, um, and it's great because out there you can redeem for like just a couple thousand points, and you get some real value. Whereas like some of the resorts, there you know it could be thirty, fifty thousand for a night, like in the Maldives or Bora Bora or something. Yeah, crazy. So what um. Obviously, you, you travel a ton for, for tennis and, and whatnot. What are some of your favorite cities uh, that you get to go to each year? Uh, um, last year, I went to south of France, and I loved that. Yeah. I stayed in Nice. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, and I, I just loved being able to go to all the little cities. I go to Antibes and Cannes yeah. and Monaco and yeah. did some really fun activities. Went sailing while I was there, so that was cool to kind of see everything from from that view yeah it's a little bit different i didn't like getting seasick but um <laughs> but other than that it was it was beautiful um and then this year so far when i was in uh australia at the end i wanted to do two trips i only ended up doing one because i ran out of time but or no, actually, I did do two trips. I take that back. I kind of get the two, like, they kind of seemed like they were together, but they weren't. Um, first, I was when I was in Brisbane, I went to Noosa. Yeah, I've been there. I loved that. Yeah. That was incredible. Um, such beautiful beaches there. And the weather was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I don't surf, but my boyfriend does. So um, that was kind of fun. And then after that, I went to Adelaide for a tournament and then played the Australian Open and then we went to Byron Bay. Oh, uh, so good, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, such a cool town. I don't, have you been to Byron Bay? Yeah, a couple times. Uh, you talk about surfing, that's uh, actually where yeah. I learned to surf was, was there. Not that I'm great or anything, but it was, it was a beautiful place. Yeah, I, I actually got on the board when I was there. I'm so bad though, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Um, Surfing's not easy. If it was good, if it was no. easy, everyone would be good at it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And being from here and, like, everything being so calm, I kind of think it, this would be a great place to <laughs> try to learn how to get up on the board. Um, right. Because there, it's just so different. But, yeah, it was so cool. The place that we stayed at was really cool. It wasn't a Marriott property. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, it was just amazing. The food, the energy, yeah. the hippy-dippy place. Yeah. And I just felt so relaxed the entire time I was there. And, you know, you just get out of bed and you throw your swimsuit on and walk to the beach. And then that's kind of it. And there's a couple different places that you can walk to and check out. Like, they have that um, the lighthouse. Yeah. So that was, like, probably about four or five-mile walk to there and then back from where we were staying. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. I hope that next year when I go back, I can do like a training week there because yeah. where I stayed, there were tennis courts right down the street. Uh, uh, nice. Really nice tennis courts too. I could have walked to them. So I think next, next year I might do like a little training week there. 
Yeah, Australia's just the best. I mean, uh, in terms of tennis, obviously, they have uh, tournaments in all the major cities, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth, and Adelaide. And, uh, but there's just so many awesome places to go. I was supposed to go down for the Aussie Open this year, but changed plans with the fires and everything. Just didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. And obviously, I watched it on TV. But I was down there uh, the year uh, you made the uh, semifinals. Uh, that was like an unbelievable run. What was that? What was that like for you? And like, what what was that like? Just keep, keep winning when you had never kind of gotten that far before in a big tournament like that. Yeah, I mean, I look back on that experience, and it seems like it was so long ago. So <laughs> I'm kind of ready to have another yeah. one of those runs. Um, but it seems like it might be a little while until that's going to get to happen again. Um, yeah, it, it was incredible. I, I love playing in Australia. There's such a rich tennis culture there. And, and everybody that comes out and supports the players, I, I think, really has a deep appreciation for what we're doing. And, and you feel it as a player when you're out there competing. And um, it's an incredible uh, venue to play in. I love playing on Margaret Court and yeah. playing Rod, La Rod Laver. Um, yeah. yeah, it was just really special. And I, I had played so many top players um, pretty much every match. Um, and I just kept going. And I just kept having the best yeah. wins of my life. So, yeah, I, uh, I wish I could have uh, gone all the way. But uh, I'll take this, the semifinals for now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, there's no shame in losing to a two-time Wimbledon champion, and uh, yeah. you know, she ended up runner-up that year, but I mean, she's a, an incredible player. Um, what was it, so I assume you played her on Rod Laver, right? Was that your first time on Laver? No, I had uh, played an, on Rod Laver the match before. Oh, against uh, Pavlush, good, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I can't say her name either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, rem I remember watching that, though. That, that's incredible. Yeah, that was a crazy match. I think I had lost the first set, um, and it was just kind of up and down. And then I was up in the second set, and then she came back, and it was uh, a bit of an emotional roller coaster. But, yeah, yeah. It, it was a lot different playing on Rod Laver versus Margaret Court because of the shade. Um, yeah. Certain times of the day, you get that where half the court is in the shade and then half is, in the, is a lot brighter. Um, right. So that was something that kind of – I. I I had seen it on TV, but then when you're actually playing um, right. on that court and that's happening, it's it's a real shock to your system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, now, I, 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 like, obviously you have, I, I've been to all the majors and I've been to pretty much all the Masters events and a lot of other events. And for me, the Australian Open, for, you know, a, a viewer, uh, the Australian Open is the best tournament in the world, I think. And then I would put it probably. That's what everyone says. Yeah, it's just such a great fan experience. I mean, it's it's incredible, and um, uh, I've actually been able to see a lot of the player facilities in Australia, and they're, and they're pretty incredible too. Um, you know, as they are at the U.S. Open in Wimbledon. Um, but in, I'd say those three in Indian Wells are the top tournaments for me as a fan. How, how do you feel as a player uh, on that? I, I'd agree with you. Um, I think the facilities that they have in Melbourne are the best out of all of the Grand Slams. Yeah. Um, the locker rooms, the dining area, the food. Um, yeah. yeah, I just, I think it's the most well-ran and it's the most player-friendly. Um, I mean, they have, they have like a sun deck up there. <laughs> yeah, there's so much space, you know, like at Wimbledon, it's such, it's so much smaller. Um, yeah. And sometimes on those first couple of days, you feel like you can't really move and everyone's just kind of pushed in there together um right. but i feel like in in melbourne if there's a rain delay and you've got hundreds of players and coaches waiting to go on for matches there's plenty of space that people can go to where you don't feel overwhelmed yeah so i really appreciate that they they kind of took that into consideration to make everybody feel like they're at home when they're on the courts because we have long days at the courts. I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but right. um, even if you don't have rain or bad weather, if you're fourth or fifth match on, you're yeah. pretty much at, on site all day. So you want to be somewhere where you're comfortable. And, um, I always feel like I'm at home there. Yeah, yeah, they do an incredible job. And again, as uh, you know, from a fan perspective, and I'm sure for you guys too, I mean, it's right in the city, essentially. I mean, you can walk there from the CBD. Or uh, where, yeah. where, do you stay in, uh, where do you stay in Melbourne? Are you in the city or are you elsewhere? I stayed at the Crown this year. Um, oh, okay. And then the year before, I stayed at the Marriott. Right. That's that's uh, that's where I stayed uh, uh, the last yeah. couple of times I've been. The Crown is great, and too, I, though, obviously. Yeah, the Crown's amazing because there's so many great restaurants uh, that are connected to the hotel. So you don't really have to go 
out that much to, yeah. to get to where you want to go. And then they have the shopping, they have the movie theater, they have the spa. It's like everything you need. But the Marriott's nice because you kind of get more of the city experience being yeah. there. Um, the Crown is its own it's its own experience yeah. i think um where the marriott if you stay there you can walk to the courts it's like five minutes mm -hmm. away yeah yeah it's crazy. so many great restaurants there were a couple of great little mexican joints uh that i had gone to a few times that i just loved people don't realize about melbourne it's it's one for me it's one of the five or six best cities in the world and that's mainly because of the, the restaurants and bars and just how everything's so easy and and i'm a big coffee guy and they have great like coffee spots all over town like and you know yeah. they take pride in like their graffiti and street art and everything it's just a cool town you know yeah their coffee's so much stronger though every yeah, time does. i have a cup of coffee there i i feel like i'm not gonna be able to sleep at night because it's so strong we're here i don't know i i know there's a difference but it's a lot stronger than it is here yeah and um you know it's funny um i i don't were you out in indian wells when they canceled indian wells were you out there training or no i wasn't i had an ab injury so i wasn't going to be able to play indian wells um okay. which was a bummer because that's one of my favorite events of the year also that's a really uh fan friendly yeah. event Great, great event, and uh, kind of like uh, Melbourne, I, I love that they have like a Nobu on site, so you can get. Yes, you know, oh, I love so Nobu. Good. Yeah, I, so after, good. After the uh, tournament last year, um, I once I was out, I uh, told my friend that was there, I was like, "We're going to Nobu." So the next day, we we went back as spectators, and we went to Nobu. We hung out. It was amazing. Uh, so and good. We went and to see the little um camper van that they had with the yeah. uh, wine uh -huh. champagne oh my gosh so cute <laughs> yeah that's uh that, that's awesome so i i, I gotta ask so you i know you played um i think four or five former number one players who who was like your um kind of idol growing up was it serena venus like who, who was it i watched so much tennis like i had the tennis channel and I don't know if, if there was one person in particular that I really liked, but I mean, I, I, I just watched so many people. I mean, I obviously remember watching the Williams sisters playing so many times and playing in finals. Yep. Seems like every grand slam, but yep. you know, I grew up watching Sharapova and Kornikova and Hingis. And, mm -hmm. um, I was talking about, I don't, I was talking to my coach the other day about Elena Dementieva. Yeah. Um, I remember. Yeah. And, Remember watching Elena Dockich and yeah. yeah, so many. I mean, so I don't really know if there's one particular person that I that you know I really idolize, but I think there's something to learn about everyone's game, and um, I I think I'm you know kind of looked up to people in different ways for different things that they did well, but um, yeah, I feel like I could learn from anybody, and I really admired all of the top players. That's good to hear. How, like, um, I guess, helpful or friendly are they toward you guys, like the younger kind of American players? Because there's a bunch of you guys that are, like, really good, kind of knocking on the, the door there. Are, are they, are, do they reach out to you if you reach out to them? Are they receptive or are they kind of, like, standoffish toward you guys? Um, I think it just depends on the, on the person. I mean, I think right. with tennis being an individual sport, um, you know, you kind of have that natural uh, part that you're really just to yourself. Um, right. So I don't know. I haven't really gotten to know a lot of the players that I looked up to. Um, so I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, but, I, you know, I see them in, around and they seem like really nice people. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I hear you. Are, are, are you are you friendly with some of the other American girls like Sloan and Taylor and Madison and like girls who are around your age? Yeah, yeah, I think all of us, uh, we've known each other for so long. Like right. Madison and I used to pl play the same tournaments. Like we would go to the um, national opens and see each other. And Madison and I used to write mail to each other and they <laughs> send each other little cards. And one time she, I remember she... Uh, when she was in Kentucky and she knew that I really liked horses. So she got me this little bracelet that had a horse on it. That's um, nice. Yeah. 
So, um, and, and Sloan too, like I remember Sloan and the 10 and unders and 12 and unders and uh -huh. her mom was always so nice and she would spend time talking to my parents and, um, and I, and Taylor Townsend, uh, we played a lot of the same tournaments as well. Um, so really I've known all of the American girls, uh, since I was a kid. Um, and everyone's really friendly and supportive. I feel like whenever any of us have good results, we all support each other and root each other on. And I think there's a lot of um, camaraderie between the Americans. That's good to hear, because like you said, tennis is an individual sport, and you know how people can get with that type of stuff. Um, what was it like for you this year? Because in one of the warm-up tournaments, I forget if it was Brisbane or Adelaide, you beat Sophia Cannon, who went on to win Australia. That must have been pretty cool for you to be like, I just beat her, and then she, she won Australia. That You know, and yeah. you know, probably know her. Yeah, I mean, we played a couple of times. We've been on two Fed Cup teams together, and... Um, even before that, we were playing a lot of the um, USTA Pro Circuit events, so we would see each other every week, and it's cool to, you know, see her, all of the hard work that she's put in, and to have it pay off, and um, yeah, it's just incredible to see another American be able to take home such a big title. I wish it would have been me, but I, I can't be happier for her. Um, you know, it's it takes so much hard work and so much perseverance. And from the time she was little, she's been kind of a, an up-and-coming uh, prodigy, and she's done so well, and, and I'm just really happy for her and her family. Yeah, it was fun to watch, and, um, you know, I thought it was interesting, and I, I actually kind of happened to agree. Her, her father had some comments about how everyone was talking about Coco Goff, and nobody was kind of paying attention to a lot of the other Americans, including uh, Cannon, um, and I was like, yeah, you're right. I mean, no one is really talking about her, and she just won the Australian Open. Everyone's talking about a 15-year-old that made, like, the, you know, the third round or whatever. What, what did you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's kind of unfortunate, I guess, for for um, for her because she did have she she achieved one of the greatest things that you can achieve in any sport, and I just think that she deserves the recognition recognition and um, support from people. And but at the same time, the media um, you know tends to pick and choose their favorite players to focus on, and I don't think that's anyone's fault. Um, it's just kind of the way it is and um coco's had some really impressive and things she's done things that people haven't done in you know 15 20 years so um there's a reason for that as well um she also is very talented and an up and coming oh, yeah. player and so i, I kind of see it from both sides but um yeah i mean there's nothing you can really do i think they should just uh Probably just focus on that Grand Slam trophy and, and uh, be happy about it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I was at Wimbledon and saw her uh, beat Venus at Wimbledon. Uh, you know, I guess it was last year. It was it was pretty awesome. Um, and you, you've beaten Venus twice and you've played her twice, right? That must have been like a huge thrill. I mean, she's a legend. No, yeah, yeah. It was it was weird being on the other side of the net from Venus. Yeah, yeah. Grow up watching so many of her matches, and then to finally be playing against her, it's almost a surreal experience. Um, and to do it twice uh, was a really big achievement for me. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't even imagine. I've uh, I've been fortunate to uh, I met Venus a few times. We have a common friend, and she's like the nicest girl in the world. And uh, but when she plays, she's such a competitor, and that must have been so cool. And like growing up, like watching her, and uh, you know, obviously Serena is. Well. Have you played Serena? I have not played Serena, not yet. Yeah, she's, uh, I mean, obviously a legend, too. It was so fun watching them. And, and they kind of took over, you know. There was, like, a little bit of a void uh, after uh, Martina and, and Chrissy. And then there was, like, Hingis and Capriati and then Davenport. But then the Williams sisters just kind of took over. And, and I think... Um, you know, at least from a, a you know a viewer perspective, we're kind of waiting for the next kind of rivalry to happen. Like, there's so many girls who are really good, uh, but no one's kind of taken the throne. You know, like like Halep, you know, she's number one, but then she loses in the first round. Or Muguruza will, you know, win Wimbledon and then like lose in the first round. Who, who do you kind of see is like taking over, or why do you think that no one has really taken the uh, the crown? Yeah, I think because of how strong the depth is across the board, I feel like it's hard for one player to, to yeah. totally yeah. dominate over yeah. everyone else yeah. in the world. Um, and again, I just think the depth is so strong. Like, you see consistently um, from tournament to tournament, somebody outside of the top 100 beating somebody yeah. that's in the top 
top 10. Um, and that doesn't happen as much on the men's side. So I think it's a credit right. to all of the, um, the female tennis players because that just does not happen on the men's side. So I think there's a lot stronger depth across the board. And it, I think it actually makes it more interesting because through and I had to decline it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it makes it more interesting because you never know who's going to come out on top at the end of the end of right. the slam. Um, I don't think a lot of people predicted that um, Sonia Kennan was going to win the Australian Open, no. even though she had been doing really well. Um, but she did, and she won it. And I don't think anybody last year would have thought to end up getting as far as she did, and she did it. So I think that this is what sports is all about, and it makes it more exciting. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I, I kind of look at it both ways. I remember um, Ostapenko won the French Open a couple years ago, and I had never heard of her at the time. And you know, and I pay attention to, to uh, women's tennis and, and just sports in general. And I was like, wow, this girl can win. She came out of nowhere. You know, I'm sure you guys knew who she was, but as a casual fan, we didn't. And and it's happened a few times, you know, and like Kennan kind of came out of nowhere, uh, at least for the casual uh, fans. So yes. it's been fun to watch, but totally different from the men's side, which obviously the three guys have dominated for, you know, 15, 20 years now, which is crazy. How do you how do you kind of see like the difference between the men's tour and the women's tour and kind of how they're perceived with the big three and everything? Um, I mean, I think it's kind of comparing like apples to oranges, like we're playing the same sport, but it's just different. Um, and I think there's a lot of different factors that go that go into it. Um, I don't know. I, I think it, it makes it especially hard with the way tennis works and it being such a long, drawn out season for there to be, you know, consistently top three that just dominate over the rest. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I kind of um, think if the season was a little bit different, maybe you would see three players like maybe we would have the top three that just dominated over everybody else but i think with um you know having a nearly 11 11 month uh season it it just it's almost impossible for that to happen yeah it's, I, I kind of agree with you there um so what do you think is going to happen with the uh, the tennis season moving forward with uh obviously with coronavirus and all this stuff do you have any kind of you know information or like whatever yeah. <laughs> No, I, I am just like everybody else kind of uh, wondering here, you know, when things are going to start up again. Um, it's a real bummer that Wimbledon ended up getting canceled and won't even be rescheduled, but I get it. I mean, you, there's only a short period of time that we'd be able to play the grass court season and yeah. all of the preparation that goes into the event, it would, you know, it's just, unfortunately, it's not going to be able to happen with how things are going in the world right now. Um yeah. And it it will be really interesting to see um, how everything will pan out if we're able to play the U.S. Open, and then literally the next week everyone has to get on a plane yeah. and go and play the French Open. Um, that will that will be very very interesting. So I, I can't wait to see what happens. So I had um I had Chris Fowler on the other day, you know, from ESPN, and and we were talking and. Um, we were talking about whether they were going to be able to play the U.S. Open and whether they were going to play it at that time in New York. And I kind of suggested, why don't they maybe, since the French Open did what they did unilaterally, maybe push the U.S. Open back and maybe play at Indian Wells just because you could play it in November, December, and the weather's, like, perfect out there at that time. I know it's not, like, yeah. tradition, but, I mean, kind of thinking outside the box to try to get all the tournaments in, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of people have thought about that, too. But I guess it's just going to come up to, you know, the decision of the the tournaments and and the tour and the WTA and the ATP and they're going to have to decide what to do. I, I'll be interested to see if if um, they're going to have us go over to China at the end of the year with yeah. everything that's going on. Um, you know, because so many of the, you know, like the end of the year tournament, I just I'm curious to see what happens there. Um, I don't know. Isn't there a tournament, or like a, a women's tournament, actually in Wuhan? I think they have one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice event. I've played it twice um, and a great venue. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a it's a hard place to compete because it's so different from, yeah. from being here. Um, and you're so used to things like just like 
I'm sure when people, when players from Asia come over to here, I'm sure that it's probably hard for them as well. But I don't know. I, um, yeah, I was kind of looking forward to going over there and playing. People don't realize, and, and not just not just tennis, but in general, how nice like Chinese cities are. Like uh, you know, people have this image of China in their head, but there's so many cities in China. Like everyone knows Wuhan now because of you know Corona, but before yeah. that, it was it's up and coming city. It's really beautiful, just like you know Suzhou or Hangzhou or Xiamen. You know these random cities that no one knows about, but they're super modern. Like everything's like brand new and really nice. It's crazy. Yeah. Um... I really liked the event in Wuhan, and I thought it was actually a pretty cool city. I didn't have time to do this, but my coach and my fitness coach actually went, like, mountain biking. Yeah. Yeah. I Like, you wouldn't think that that would be, like, an activity to do while you're there, but they went and did it, and they really liked it. Um, I haven't really honestly been there long enough to get to do a lot of sightseeing when I'm there, because... Yeah. It seems like every year that I've gone to China, I haven't done very well. Like I've lost right. first round or second rounds, and then I have to get home. So yeah. I I would like to be able to see some more things while I'm there, and I I would like to do the Great Wall. Um, That's every so time good. Thing, it's been on my list, but last year it was a little bit. Um, it was bad weather the last two days I was there, so unfortunately I, it wasn't a good day to do it. And uh, guys, we're going to get to your questions. I've seen a million questions on the bottom and just chatting. Um, so you brought up like kind of, you know, losing quickly and stuff like that. So with with regards to cost, obviously it's expensive um, in tennis because you got to travel, stay in hotels. You got to pay a uh, coach, trainer, that type of thing. I, I, how does it work? Do you have um, the U.S. Tennis um, Federation or whatever? Do they supplement you or is everything out of your pocket? Like, how does that work for you guys? Yeah, the USK doesn't really do much, um, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly. They don't really uh, offer much uh, or any right. financial support. So um, it's interesting compared to other sports because most sports have a federation that actually contributes financially uh, to right. their athletes. And um, I think it's been a big controversy that a lot of people don't talk about publicly. Right. Um, I think in the future that that's something that could change. Mm -hmm. um, because there is, especially during the time when you're trying to get into the top 100, yeah. you're not making as much as you're spending. Yeah. Um, and the financial stresses that come along with that, um, unless you have a private sponsor or somebody that's helping you, um, it's hard to be in a position where you feel comfortable. Um, and it's also hard for players to be able to treat their careers like a true professional um i feel like tennis is one of the only sports where you've got players going to a tournament literally by themselves without a coach or a hitting partner or a family member or anything i there are countless players that i know and have seen where they go consistently without having anybody on the road with them um yeah i think at, at this level in the in the top 100 it's a bit different because everybody's at a point in their career where they're able to afford to, to have somebody with them full time. Um, but it is stressful. And I think that was one of the biggest adjustments I had to make from going to going from playing for a college team where everything was organized for me, our travel was free, our school that was paying for it, an organization that looked after us, um, coaches that looked after us, physio that looked after us. Um, you don't have all of those luxuries when you're you're playing individually and the first couple of years um it was it was hard for me because um I was always able to have a coach but I wasn't able to you know I have a fitness coach or a physio um now I've gotten to the point where I can have one on the road with me which is which has been a really big game changer because um you know when you are traveling four or five weeks at a time and you're not able to get treatment for an injury that you might right. have or um, you're not able to keep up with your fitness because you don't have a consistent uh, program that you do or somebody to help you. Um, it's hard to be the best that you can be. Yeah, that's a great point uh, that you don't think about unless it's unless it's you in in the situation. You know, because um, like as fans, we see you know like. Federer, Djokovic, Serena, they have like 20 people with them at all times. And you don't yeah. really think about how much that actually costs because those are real people who need to make money too and travel and, and sleep and, and this and that. Yeah, and I'm sure they're, I'm sure if 
I'm sure their expenses are close to, I would say, at least a million dollars a year. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, probably more, depending yeah. on how many people that they have traveling with them. But you think about all the airline tickets, yeah. all of the hotel rooms, all of, if you rent a house, even that is expensive. Um, the food, uh, it all adds up. I remember yeah. the first time I went to Tokyo, I was in Tokyo for two tournaments and it was me the um my hitting partner and a fitness coach and i think that those two weeks came to about twenty thousand dollars um and and that being one of my first experience of that was that was one of the first times that i played two wta tournaments back to back that was right when i started kind of drifting away from the usta pro circuit events and transitioning into more of a wta schedule I was like, how am I going to afford this? That's expensive. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a clothing sponsor at that point in time. I wasn't being paid by a racket sponsor, I don't think, at that point in time. Um, so those things can be stressful. And luckily, I had support in other ways. Uh, having the uh, Oracle Collegiate Grant, uh, that was a really big game changer for me. Um, and then also having a private sponsor as well, that, that took a lot of um stress off of my plate but still you know you look at the, your credit card bill or you look at you know how much you're paying your coach for that week and versus how much you're making and you're like yeah. i don't know how this is going to be sustainable <laughs> yeah yeah no it's uh it's it's, it's mind-blowing numbers to think about especially uh like just out of college you know like a 2021 yeah. year old kid uh you know and i guarantee you like anybody that's playing baseball or football or basketball they don't know what the team's expenses look like. They don't even know what the expenses would look like for themselves. Yeah. So, you know, in tennis, you have to take full responsibility for all of not just your not just your tennis career, but the whole financial aspect of it, too. And a lot of the players, too, are doing their own taxes, which blows my mind. I wouldn't trust myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's a that's a whole nother stress. I mean, you know, if you if you got coaches and people that are traveling with you and working for you, um, and you take on that too, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I trust me, I hear you. I have my own uh, tax issues with paying people in different countries, getting paid in different currencies. Yeah. you know, this and that. It's a it, it's a pain. Um, you know, it's funny. I uh, I know a lot of uh, golfers, and you know how they travel, and you know, similar to tennis, it's all over the place. But the difference is, you guys really need like a hitting partner or coach physio, you know, to be really, really present there for all the tournaments, you know, whereas they kind of just show up, maybe have a coach, yeah. but they could also do it, you know, on the computer, that kind of thing. So right. <laughs> right. it's a lot different. Yeah. That's, uh, and, that, that's crazy. and that's one of the things like it, when I first got started and was just traveling with a coach, I'd, I'd say, okay, I just need a coach. But then I realized, mm -hmm. you know, if you lose first round and it's a, you know, five or six days before the next tournament, starts you need somebody to be able to practice against yeah and a lot of times um you know the players will practice with each other which is really nice but other times they might want to just hit with their coach and you know what i've learned too is there's not a lot of there's some but some there are some coaches that are just coaches and there's some that are able to hit um and can serve as a hitting partner as well and then depending on like the age and everything too yeah that plays a factor. So um, I, I struggled with that a little bit because there were times where I was traveling with a coach and then there were times where I was just traveling with a hitting partner. And then I was like, I need a coach. And then I, then I can, all, then I have the coach and then I need a hitting partner. So now yeah. I just said, okay, I need to have both. I realized that I need to be able to practice. I realized that there's certain things that I like to be able to do on court. And um, I like to have a certain type of practice and, I don't want to, you know, hold another player to doing what I want to do the entire time. So it's nice to be able to have my hitting partner and coach and then just be able to do what I need to do and not worry about it. Yeah, no, it's uh, that's really interesting and things you don't really think about. Um, I, I two things before we get to questions I wanted to ask you. So, like, for instance, uh, you, you fly halfway around the world to, you know, Tokyo, for instance, and then you don't know how long you're going to be there. Let's say you lose early. Do you have round trip tickets or do you just buy one way tickets? Um, usually, well, Chris books all does all of the flights now. So that <laughs> is amazing because what I used to do, yeah, I, used Chris. To, <laughs> I used to just, 
um, I would book my flight there and then I would hold off on booking my return flight because a lot of times the change fees yeah. can be more expensive than if you just wait to book your flight. And then I, I, I too, I didn't like having to get on the phone with the airline and then be on hold yeah. for like an hour and a half trying to change three people's flights. Um, mm. So usually I would just do it once I knew when I needed to leave. Um, but then there's other times too, when you're entering certain countries where you actually have to have a return flight, um, yeah, yeah. and be able to present that, uh, when you enter the country. Um, so I, I did do that a couple times too. Now you guys, um, you guys play in, uh, in the middle East, you guys play in, uh, Qatar and you guys also play in Dubai. Is that right? Yeah. And have you played in both those tournaments? So I went to Dubai this year and I thought I was going to be able to compete, but I had, um, I tore my rectus abdominis in the beginning of the, um, in the year and at the Australian open actually. And, um, I thought I was going to be able to play Dubai and I couldn't, and I had to pull out on site Aye. and then I knew I wasn't going to be able to play in Doha. So I, um, had to pull out of that as well, but, um, I went all the way to Dubai, was there, couldn't compete. Yeah. So I was at the event, I was able to practice a little bit. Um, and I really don't regret it because I got to uh, see Dubai. I got to experience the whole trip and it was amazing. It's it almost didn't even feel like a tennis trip. Yeah, Dubai, Dubai is, uh, for those who haven't been there, it's one of my favorite um, places. I feel like you could live in, I mean, I know Federer like, yeah. lives in Dubai, basically. You could, like, live there. They have everything you need. I could everything, live there. Everything is really nice. <laughs> yeah, I could live there. It is so nice. And the, they have the most amazing restaurants, too. Oh, good, yeah. 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 I think it's actually comparable to, like, New York City. I, I think New York has some of the best food in the world because yeah. it's such an eclectic mix and it's a melting pot. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like Dubai is the same way. I, I, I always say this, uh, Dubai is kind of like um, New York in terms of it has everything you need. And it's kind of like Las Vegas with weather, just without the casinos and like the real trashy factor. It's just the nice place. Yeah, to be, yeah. You know? nice. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm not crazy about Las Vegas either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't, yeah. Uh, I, I remember uh, um, I was in Tahoe uh, earlier this year, and Chris asked me if there was, like, tennis oh courts out there. Oh, my gosh. Did, did you I end up going to Tahoe? Lake Tahoe. It's one of my favorite places. So nice, right? Yeah, it is so nice. I, I went in the summer um, last year because I was in Vegas for World Team Tennis, and then I got a flight from Vegas into the – not there's not an airport in Tahoe, but whatever's outside of that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Dro yeah, drove to Tahoe, and it was unbelievable. It's yeah. one of my favorite places. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And that was after my my trip to South of France, and it almost didn't feel real, like being yeah. on the lake there and the water being so blue and placid. I mean, it was just amazing. It was the, one of the best weeks of my life, and doing the hiking and the trails. Oh. I could live there for sure. Yeah, Tahoe is amazing. One of my uh, good friends actually uh, lives there. I was out there for the, uh, the celebrity golf tournament, and um, yeah, I got to see all these like Find amazing me people. Up. I'll go. <laughs> so good, right? <laughs> you you can probably sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we get to questions, and everybody, we're going to have questions in a couple minutes. I just wanted to ask you uh, one other thing. So you're like one of the most successful college tennis players of all time, which is pretty cool. You won two national championships. Uh, I don't know how many people have ever done that, but what was um, kind of your thought process of like going to college versus going pro? Cause I know, you know, it's like half people do that. Half people just go pro. What was your kind of process? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think I always like as a kid wanted to be a professional tennis player. Right. Um, but when you get older, reality sinks in. And not everyone's like Coco Goff. Like, right. not everybody is this amazing athlete and develops so quickly into their game. And I just wasn't ready to, to go to that level. I kind of needed another stepping stone to get me where I am now. Um, and I also, too, was realistic in the sense that I didn't have federation support. The USTA right. never gave me anything. Um, yeah. as a junior and that made me realize, okay, how am I going to do this? My family wouldn't be able to support me financially to play 
tennis. Right. And I still want to play professionally maybe at some point, but I kind of had to make the decision. I, I, I almost in some ways had to go to college if I wanted to do this because right. um, otherwise it would have, it just wouldn't have worked. I, I don't even think I could have played a full schedule of USTA Pro Circuit events and could have afforded it. I mean, I, right. yeah, it wouldn't have worked. So um, I went to University of Florida my freshman year. Right. Um, I had an interesting experience there. I actually didn't play in the lineup at the end of the year. Um, my coach really? benched me and um, it was, yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, I think he may have had a very inaccurate assessment of uh, me as a tennis player, um, right. an athlete, and just, yeah, I, I don't really know uh, what happened there, but um, I wasn't going to spend my whole college career sitting on a bench. Um, yeah, I had yeah. some pretty, uh, some pretty big goals in front of me that I wanted to achieve and realized I, I wasn't going to be able to do that at University of Florida. So I transferred to University of Virginia. I, I looked there um, while I was in high school and it ultimately came down between Florida and Virginia. Um, so I knew immediately where I wanted to go to school. Um, and I actually at the time had a boyfriend, a serious boyfriend that was on the tennis team at Virginia. So that, that definitely pushed the influence a little bit. Um, but it was the right decision. I um, I had the best years of my life there. Um, yeah. I got to win the two the two national championships. I had a lot of adversity while I was there too. I um, when I first got there, I actually found out that I had a broken wrist, and this wasn't until the end of the semester right. uh, because they thought it was just tendonitis. And then after three months of doing rehab and it not getting better, I went. And um, went to the doctor and they said, when did you break your wrist? Right. And they told me I, I would need to have surgery to get rid of the, the pain. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to have to sit out another season right. um, and not play. And so I, I said, I'm not going to do the surgery. I played with, that, with this injury the entire season. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing really well. I won the national championship and I got surgery two days later. Because um, I knew I was going to have to play in the U.S. Open uh, during the, the summer, and I wanted to be ready for that. Yeah. Um, so that that was hard. It, it, you know, there was so much uncertainty during those first two years with the injury and then having to transfer. Um, and then my junior year, I, I lost in the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament to Jamie Lowe, who's also on tour. Mm -hmm. Um and now playing professionally. I think she left college um, her junior year to turn pro. Um, and so that that kind of made me think, okay, well, maybe I maybe I won't play professionally after after tennis. Maybe I'll do something else. But then right. I won the national championship my senior year, and, and I kind of thought, why not? You know, I've made so many awesome connections here, and I think there could be some – potential people that would be willing to help me in my career and, and yeah. financially back me. And I was able to find that. And, um, yeah, it, it just, I got lucky and I, uh, started to do pretty well on tour. I think, I think it was, um, maybe within the third or fourth pro tournament that I played, I won 25 K and then I kind of had some confidence from that and was like, okay, if I stick with this long enough, I can get into the top hundred. And then you won a tournament. You won your first pro tournament in Newport Beach, right? Yeah. I well, I won my first one twenty five k there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. So, um, because I I had played some you know ITF pro circuit events that I had won. Yeah. Um, but that was probably the biggest one that I had won. Um, awesome. Yeah. So it was it was definitely the right decision going to oh. taking that route because. I just wouldn't have had the same transition that I had um, if I would have went from juniors to pros. And I think I made a lot of the, um, I think I made a lot of improvements within my game while I was in college. I had such great coaches at UVA. Uh, my forehand used to be a disaster. It was just, yeah, it wasn't, it was just terrible. And now my forehand's a weapon. Um, and it took a lot of hard work and my serve improved a lot while I was in college mentally. 
I matured so much. I went through so many different things that forced me to grow up. And um, I had so many challenges, too, with my health, with injuries. And it just made me a much stronger person. And so I um, I think college can be a great thing for, for all tennis players. Um, yeah. I don't think uh, it sets you back in any way. I think that learning how to play on a team is really valuable. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's, it's a, an experience that I get to treasure forever. I got to do that with teammates and that's really cool because now when I have success like it's different you know I'm just playing essentially for myself where before it was really fun yeah. competing with other people and and working together as a team yeah it's interesting it's a totally different dynamic and uh you know it, it that's cool that you got to do that I know uh, Isner says a very similar thing playing in Georgia <laughs> and having the success you did um I'm just going through some questions here um uh, someone's, uh, my friend Joe actually is asking what it's like to uh, stay uh, fit and practice during uh, quarantine. Uh, you touched on it in the beginning, but you've been practicing every day or a lot? Yeah, I've been, I've been practicing um, at least four times a week, I think. Um, I um, have a court here where I live, so that helps because um, a lot of the parks are now closed. Um, so I've been able to get on court every day. My hitting partner has been in here in St. Pete. And, um, I also, when all of this stuff started with the coronavirus and everyone was panicking, I, I panicked too. And I was like, how am I going to get my workouts in? So I turned my bonus room into a mini gym. Nice. Yeah. So that, that's been, that's been really great because I don't know what I would do if I wasn't able to get into the gym. Um, so I have, yeah, I have like all of the basic things that I need to be able to get in a good workout in. I have a trap bar, a straight bar. I have the landmine, yep. uh, power blocks. Um, so that I've been able to get my full workouts in and my fitness coach is here. So oh, nice. able to, um, yeah, I'm able to work out pretty much every day. Um, and it's keeping me sane because if I yeah. was like, if I was just not doing anything, I, I feel like it would be like Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear that. It um, kind of feels like that. <laughs> yeah, even with doing stuff, it still feels like that. Um, so a couple yeah. a couple questions here uh, from some of the viewers. Um, if you could win one major, which one would it be? And one other tournament that's not a major, which would it be? Read that one more time. What what Grand Slam would you like to win? And aside from the Grand Slams, what secondary tournament would you like to win? I would like to win any Grand Slam. I'll take any of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about that? Um, Good answer. And I'd like to win Indian Wells. Because yeah. Oracle, Oracle is just one of the main sponsors yeah. of the event. And they sponsor me, and I would love to do I would love to be able to win that tournament. Have, have you played, um, speaking of Indian Wells, have you played uh, Andreescu? No. I haven't. Not yet. I feel like you guys have a little bit of a similar game. You guys both are powerful. Oh, that's such a nice compliment. Thank I, you. Yeah. I, and I, 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 love, I love watching her. So yeah, I, I, I love to see you guys play. Yeah, she's incredible. Such a great athlete and so yeah. versatile. Really fun to watch. Yeah, I hope she can uh, stay healthy. She's a lot of fun to watch, and I, I love her uh, intensity, the attitude. You know, I, she's got uh, she's got that chip on her shoulder, you know? Yeah, spunky. Spunky, there you go. Uh, Someone's asking you, if you weren't a tennis player, what would your profession be? I think about that sometimes, and I don't know. I feel like I could do so many things. Sometimes I'm like, I'll be a jewelry designer. Yeah. I I feel like I could be an architect, too. I don't know. I feel like I could do just about anything besides, like, being a doctor. I I definitely couldn't do that. Um, I don't know. I really don't know because I love my career and I plan on doing this for a while, so I'm just right. not sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I mean, listen, make yeah. as much money as you can, play tennis as long as you can. There's a few better ways to make a living than that. God. Yeah. I mean, I, I love jewelry. I have a passion for art. I like anything with design, really. So I think uh, eventually I'm going to have my own full-fledged jewelry line, and that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Very and cool. I'm going to do that along with my tennis. So yeah, double whammy. <laughs> there you go. Like uh, I think I think uh, Serena and Venus do a lot of designing jewelry, clothes. I know Venus is like getting into hotel design and stuff like that. Yeah, so cool. Crazy stuff. 
Uh, someone's asking if you like um, Rome tournament. Um, have you played there? And which of the European uh, Masters play events do you like? I have played in Rome. Um, it's a really awesome place to play in. Yeah. I, I feel like everybody wants to go to Rome at some point in their life. The architecture, the history, the culture, it's it's in an experience of its own. Um, but I would say out of all of my favorite tournaments, uh, I really like Indian Wells. Yeah. Um, I like Madrid also. I think that's a beautiful uh, venue. Yeah. And I love the food. I think they have some of the best food at that tournament. Yeah, the uh, the, the Caja Magica, right? And, uh, yeah. The Magic Box. Um, in, in Rome, I, I think that's such a great venue. They have that one court. It's like dug out. It's like Pietrangeli or something like that. Yeah. Statues, like at the top of the city. So cool. So cool. Yeah, really cool. Awesome, uh, awesome place. Um I'm just going through the uh, uh, questions here. Did you, oh, this is a good one, actually. Did you choose your sponsors? Like, did you go after them, or did they come for you? Um, I feel like, I feel like it was pretty mutual. Yeah. Um, I feel like it was all, like, pretty mutual relationships. Like, I know... You know, Chris has reached out to different companies and set things up um, that way. But it was also like, too, I was kind of like, Chris, I, I would really like to work with this company. I'm really passionate about this. And right. so I feel like it, it's all been pretty mutual. Yeah. Um, or I've just like developed relationships, too, or friendships with people that have worked for the company. And then it's kind of naturally come about. Right. Um, were you, uh, someone's asking about, uh, Wozniacki, were you friends with her? Like, uh, did you ever get to play her before she retired? Yeah, um, we played three times. Um, she beat me twice, and then the other time, I, but she, I had that, so I don't really know. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I don't it counts, know. it counts. The win, um... But, yeah, we played a couple of times. Very cool. She seems like a nice person, Emily. Mean, I've never met her, but she seems nice. Yeah, she's very nice. Um, always really friendly and talkative. Yeah, yeah, I remember uh, she made the uh, U.S. Open final one year and then, like, did the interview in, like, six different languages or something. It's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think, like, being from Europe and just being exposed to so many different cultures, I think that's the coolest thing when people can speak yeah. so many different languages. I feel so dumb that I can only speak... English. So I just got Rosetta Stone, and I'm going to I'm going to brush up on some of that Spanish that I learned in, in college, and uh, hopefully learn another new language along with that. Okay, we have uh, a minute and fifteen left before uh, uh, Instagram kicks us off. So I'm gonna ask you one last question, but before I do, I just want to say thank you to everyone for uh, for watching. Danielle, this has been awesome, so much fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And, and my last question before you go is. Um, with the Miami tournament, what did you think of them moving it into a football stadium? Um, I thought it was really creative. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked the other venue. I thought it was really nice. It, it was a little bit hard to get to in 